Did you ever take a? Because I always ask athletes who like play against, like we did with some with the Browns, and we and I asked them like, do you do you sit out there and watch like Lamar go to work? Did you ever find yourself like on the sideline watching uh, Reggie? Um, not really. And and one of the reasons why was, um, Coach Weiss did something really unique in preparation for that week. He had us sit down and watch an entire game. We watched their game versus Arizona State. And his whole point was like, I want our offense to see why we're doing what we're doing and what they're up against. And really, it was specifically to see like Reggie, which I don't know if that helped the confidence of our defense. <laughs> but Man, I like, can't. I remember watching that because that was the first time like I really was able to sit back and just kind of enjoy because I was already prepping for their defense. But right. I was like, All right, I get to watch Reggie. And I, and I, I called him, tried to recruit him to Notre Dame back when we were the same, we're the same class. Um, and I remember being like, <gasps> like every time he touched the ball. <gasps> Like, he's going to take it to the house. Like, yeah. that's how he made you feel. Like, you saw highlights on ESPN, but then, like, just sitting back and watching an entire game where every single time he touches the ball, he makes some dude miss, and he does something that you're just going, dude, no one moves like that. Like, right. he's he's the greatest college football player I've seen in my lifetime. Now, I know, like, there's others, obviously, that will be up there, like, all, with all due respect to them. He's the greatest that I've seen in my lifetime. Mm, I definitely have to agree. But, like, I, that's our childhood, bro. Yeah. Like, the video games, all of that. Like My first year at tackle football, I wore 25. Well, this is when he was with the Saints, but this is how young I am. But yeah. he was with the Saints, and so I had to get, I had to wear 25 as well. But yeah. And I also had the Adidas cleats. Those were not the prettiest cleats. But, like, I mean, I just I was a fan of Reggie Bush, so I got them. But, um, yeah, so talking about that season, like you guys, I mean, that game was crazy because we got to wear the green jerseys against Florida State, but we walked out of them in, in warm up. So it wasn't the same and it wasn't the same type of atmosphere. And I'm sure like walking back in into the locker room, like, well, I want to touch on that, that just that quick moment right there. Dude, people like were ready to like fight. I mean, you could have, you could have sent us anywhere in that. Like we felt invincible. We felt like everything was kind of like on our side and just the hype behind it. I mean, it was, it was, it was one kind of cool. And I think once it wore off of like the opportunity to wear them and understanding the meaning behind it, um, it then was like, okay, we got to put like our game face back on. Like that was one of the things I think coach Weiss, like kind of was witnessing was, okay, now I have to get them calm back down because I need to focus on what our game plan is. Cause we have to play a certain type of game plan in order to compete with this team. Mm -hmm. Cause they're that good. Um, and so that was one of, I think his biggest things too. And like, once we got him on, it was like, okay, like, let's, let's get back to what our game plan is for trying to stop this team. Mm -hmm. But it was, I mean, we were ready to, you know, go to war, man. It was, it was one of the coolest kind of feelings and that whole week, just thinking back on it. And obviously it, it stinks that it ended the way that it did. Um, you know, especially, especially when the clock first ran out and everyone's running the field, I'm like, we did it. We did it. Yeah. I was yeah. like, I was like, it, it, like everything he had said came true. And then, you know, obviously the rest is history. I know you wanted to talk about uh, junior year and why. Yeah. So I'm doing my research and obviously I'm a big Browns fan. So I knew of you coming out, but before you came out the year before you were still highly touted. Yeah. A lot of love. Why did you decide to come back? Did the bowl game have anything to do with that or? Uh, no, it didn't have anything to do with it. Honestly. Um, I wanted to get my degree. Uh, I felt like I had a lot of unfinished business, you know, from football academically, um, you know, really looking back on it. I mean, maybe I could have taken the opportunity to come out in that draft, but I just, I felt like I owed it to like everyone at Notre Dame, my teammates, the guys I, I came there with coach Weiss, um, the university. Like I just, I went there with a mission on trying to win a national championship. And I knew our class was like special enough to have a shot. Um, you know, in the end, again, it, it didn't end up working out the way I'd hoped or way I wanted to, but um, that was more of like the biggest motivating factor behind it is just kind of wanting to make sure I got that degree, but like wanting to try to that feeling of just having unfinished business. How was um, coach Weiss as a coach? Because <laughs> I feel like, I see it as, well, I only know from, like, him getting fired and moving on and then Coach Kelly coming in. But, like, I wasn't, like, I wasn't obviously, like, paying attention to football as much as I was when I was older. But um, on that 2005 season, 2006, like, when he was winning and, like, having good season. So, like, what, uh, what do you think, like, led to, I guess, just the downfall of his time at Notre Dame? You know, I, I don't. I don't know what led to it. I mean, I can't. 
you know, speak to that because I wasn't there and I was, you know, dealing with my my journey in the NFL. But mm. um, the things I loved about him was the system that he put in. I mean, he was a great, he is a great teacher of football. Like that's one of the things that I think gets like underlooked is when he came in. So we had a guy named David Cutcliffe, who was our offensive coordinator, quarterback coach. The Duke. Uh, the Duke head coach. Yeah, right. And mm. so he was at Tennessee before that, I believe, uh, with Peyton. And he had, he had done a physical. They found out he needed a triple bypass like, like yesterday. And so he's got to go. Like he goes, they have open heart surgery, all this stuff. So we don't have a quarterback coach. And so Coach Weiss sat in there that first spring he got there with me every single day. And we go through the offense. And it was a New England Patriots playbook. So I'm opening it up, looking at the same thing Tom Brady was. And I grew up, obviously, you know, looking at Michigan, watching Tom Brady through those formidable years in my life in high school and being like, dude, like I want to follow in that guy's footsteps, right? Mm-hmm. That's one of the reasons why I was so interested in Michigan. Um, and so – like that experience is you just saw how good of a teacher he was. Like when he was trying to hit home a point, it doesn't matter if it was to like our offense, our defense, whoever it was, like he knew how to drive home that point and get it to stick in your mind. So when you're out there in the field, like you remembered it. So I, I like, I love that about it. Appreciated that about him. Um, you know, he was the type of guy that wasn't going to like BS you. Like he was not like going to tell you something that wasn't true. Like he would tell you straight how it is and you might not like it, Cause it's like that Jersey side of him. If you like, you know, someone from Jersey, like Man, you know how they are. Our Jersey people, yeah, they diff. <laughs> the whole they're, East Coast, the whole yeah. North East Coast. That's what I'm saying. Like New York, New Jersey, like they have that kind of like, hey, they're not going to BS you, right? And that's how he was. Like he was gonna, he was gonna keep it hard. But you knew, always knew where you stood. You always knew where you stood. Like you didn't walk into a situation and and know whether or not like if you're on a shit list or if, or if like you're in a good spot, right? Like you knew, and I always appreciated that because I I kind of hate I liked when things you know, where you could be decisive. And I think it helps where you like, you know where you're standing, you know what you need to do. And he was great at doing that. Um, so look, I, I, I had a great relationship with coach, mm-hmm. um, you know, still do to this day. Uh, he lives just North from here. Um, but he was always a good dude, good dude to me. But you know, as far as like what happened afterwards, you know, I don't know. It's tough. Cause again, I'm not, I wasn't as intricately involved. And right. um, I was just trying to win games up in Cleveland. Yeah. So. But no, we, I mean, we get to, we get to the end of your Notre Dame career. You had an amazing career. Um, played last season, your senior season, you played at a Heisman level. And I definitely want to talk about, because you just started the Fun um, Foundation Mm -hmm. at Notre Dame. And I want to talk about how you think you would have capitalized on NIL (laughs) at, in that position that you were in at Notre, like I, because I was, I was a roommate with, uh, Ian Book was my roommate. And so like, I, I, he, I saw the stuff that he went through and just, but I just feel like, he didn't play at that at that Heisman level. He didn't have that like Heisman like aura around him. You did. Um, so I'm interested to see like or hear, hear about like how you think that would have impacted um, your career. I mean, it would have helped my family. That's for sure. Like yeah. that, that decision you talked about for my junior year would have been a lot easier to come back, um, knowing the position we were in at that point. But you know, I think the toughest thing was is thinking back on that. Is you know, at Notre Dame, you have like the number one jersey that you know you see that's in the bookstore. And then usually you had like the year, whatever it was, right? right? Like 05, 06, whatever, right? Um, but then when you started seeing the number 10s, you're like, all right, man. Like I know my name's not on the back, but mm-hmm. like you guys weren't selling that stuff before. So, um, you know, that kind of stuff was flattering. But I, I think looking back on it, like, yeah, it would have worked out pretty well when you're a part of a, you know, a national brand in college football and, you know, things are going well. I mean, we, you know, between – and it wasn't like it was just me. I mean – a bunch of the guys on the team. I mean, you think about Tommy, who was turning into professional boxing at that point. I mean, he was he did a fight that summer before our senior year in Madison Square Garden, right? Like, yeah. like trust me, like Jeff Samarja just got you know drafted. Right. Um, you know, it was it was fun with all those guys. I mean, I, that's what I think about is like how everyone would be able to capitalize off of it. Um, but I mean, the, the biggest thing is it, it just would have made life a little easier. Yeah. Like I look at, like I used to take our offensive lineman to Bruno's, and so we used to go there on Thursday nights. And they had this all-you-can-eat kind of buffet deal. And I I, I literally worked on my Monday on my off day mm-hmm. just to make money to pay for those guys to be able to eat on Thursdays because I always want to pick up their tab. So, like, it would have made that easier, right? Yeah. I would have been, like, scrounging around for change to, like, for <laughs> gas money or whatever it was. Um, but, I mean, outside of it, I, don't, I mean, I, I don't think – I think a lot of these kids that are looking to make, like, life-changing money from NIL – like you're missing the point. Like this is just one of the first steps in getting to the professional level mm-hmm. where you then make generational wealth and change, you know, life changing money. Mm-hmm. What do you think of the direction that NIL is going? Because 
my last year of college ball, it got enacted six months later. So I wasn't a part of that universe, but obviously you get to see how these kids are reacting to it. You're seeing kids enter the portal, leaving just solely off the monetary reasons, not necessarily yeah. the system, coach, school, none of that. It's free agency to, to a certain extent. So what are your thought on, thoughts on that portion of the game where it's headed? I think the idea of the transfer portal was good. When you combine it with NIL, though, you open up the door for that to happen, where, where you've got kids who are being induced. Jordan Addison, for example, right? Leaving Pitt, he's the Blitnikoff winner. You know, he's got one more year of eligibility before he's going to go to the NFL, be a first-round pick. Yeah, maybe he wants to go play with Caleb Williams. They're both from Maryland. You know, maybe they both want to go play together or something. But there's clearly more to that story and what he was maybe offered or, you know, talked about. But whatever the case may be, I just think it's the combination of the two. And so you've got to adjust one and probably the transfer portal because that's not going to create a lawsuit for you. Um, to limit then the ability for teams to be able to snatch players off other rosters, right, and right. tamper, because that's what they call it in the NFL. It's, it's really tampering. But as far as the NIL space, it just it needs more – there needs to be more governance. And I'm not saying to cap what a player can make. I'm just saying they need to figure out a way to limit some of the adults in the room. And it's sad to say that. Like, it's not the players. It's the adults. It's the attorneys. It's the agents. It's these – guys who are trying to like latch on to these kids in high school or these kids who have, have showed some promise in college and get in the transfer portal to then take a percentage of what they're making and try to go to find them NIL deals. Mm. Does that have the player's best interest in mind? Probably not. Like is the player getting his degree or is he just entering the transfer portal going for a payday? Is is that guy building a network, that player? Because football is going to end one day. Right. And then when it does, like do they have a network now or did they already transfer to another school and now they don't really know anyone mm. and they were there to be a mercenary just to go play football and that was it. So I just I think I look at the overall development now of, you know, how the transfer portal can affect kids, and I'm all for kids getting an opportunity to play, but then when you kind of talk about the reasons behind why they're leaving and all that, it starts to make the waters a little muddied, um, and I think there's just there's a lot of bad actors with the like the representation like the agents or attorneys who get involved in this stuff, and they they've got to find a way of monitoring it, regulating it, or providing some sort of governance over it to eliminate some of the, the bad stuff that's taking place. How do you see the collective fund um, playing out? Yeah, I mean, as of right now, you know, we've worked with uh, a number of student athletes, uh, both with the football team, women's basketball team. Uh, we're about ready to start with the men's basketball team. We're expanding to really, you know, all the sports, you know, we, we can to really help out as many student athletes in Notre Dame, you know, leverage their NIL. Uh, and, and we like to do it by utilizing charitable causes. And so our, our, our niche, and I think what makes this unique and different from everyone else and makes it more like the Notre Dame way is, you know, we try to find out what these student athletes are passionate about in regards to, you know, charitable purposes and trying to change the world in that way. And then we try to partner them up with those other charities to help with fundraising events and appearances and signings and videos and social media posts, all that good stuff. Uh, and then help them be able to, you know, make money off of it. So the charity wins, the player wins, we're a 501 C three. So the donor gets a tax deduction. And so really everyone wins. And, you know, instead of it just being you know, what you see out there in these other spaces where you've got collectives who are just paying kids because they play football, like we're, we're compensating kids for them accomplishing something and then building their brand, not just as a Notre Dame student athlete, but as one that's like charting a, a, a charitable cause that's passionate to them. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of these guys, I mean, we've had some really cool stories. Guys who wanted to help out the homeless shelter because at one time in their life, they were in a homeless shelter or wanted to help out the YMCA because at one point in time in their life, they, they were at the YMCA, uh, Boys and Girls Club, um, Cultivate Hunger, you know, all these things. And that's what that's what's different. It's like there's a, a real impact on the community and on other people's lives at a positive impact that they're making. And NIL is making it possible. I got to figure out a way to get myself on the board. I, I think I know the right person to talk to. OK. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, can, we, we, we can we can work with that. Um, I want to get definitely get into the NFL. Um, we're both us being from Cleveland yeah, man. and going first round. Cleveland, was, yeah. this is for you. Yeah. But he could, he's die, he's a diehard Cleveland fan, so I definitely want him to touch on this a little bit. No, I, I just the, the the one thing that comes to mind, and the older I've gotten, I've understood that circumstances matter. And then when you're a kid, you know that you don't really care about the circumstances. You just want to see your team be, be great, be right? Be great, yeah. And then the older you get, you're like, holy cow, like, you need top-down structure in order for any player to succeed. Yeah. I guess, one, what was your thought process when the Browns traded up to get you? Yeah. Because 
there was a lot of talk that you were going to go three, but then Joe Thomas ended up going three instead. What was that thought? What was your thought process like in that moment? And then, is there any regret, or do you ever envision a scenario where the Browns didn't take you? Yeah, I mean, I, I can play that out easily. So I knew they weren't going to take me at three because Phil Savage, their general manager at the time, told me the night before the draft, if you and Joe Thomas are there, we're going to take Joe Thomas at three. And obviously, he's a first battle Hall of Famer, in my opinion. So I completely, one, understood that. I played with Joe um, back in the uh, U.S. Army All-America game, knew of him from his time in Wisconsin. So I knew how special he was as a player. Um, but it was just unique. Like, my agent, Tom Condon, was like, dude, I've never had a GM tell me what they're going to do the night before the draft. He's like, that's either a smoke screen or he's just a really good dude. And come to find out, he's just he's a really good dude. Phil Savage is one of the best people in football. Um, and he was he was just trying to be honest because he knew how much, like I like you guys, I grew up Cleveland Browns fan. Mm-hmm. Like, I was wearing the Bernie Kosar jersey when I was young. Like, you guys are too young, but, like, you have to understand my frustration – with the team, like, isn't the fumble, right? It's It was the fact that they left. Like, from, what, 95 to 99, I think it was. Like, they left. There wasn't a Cleveland Browns team to go up and see and root for. And it was, like, it's it's weird when you think about it. Like, just a team uprooting and leaving and wow. going to Baltimore. I'm like, well, I'm not, I'm not rooting for the Ravens. Like, that's not my team anymore. Like, I'm waiting until the Browns come back. And so, um, that, like, plays into, like, my entire experience. Because, like, what other organization, like, they became an expansion team. And it wasn't the same team that, like, I remember growing up watching. Mm-hmm. Like, the, the Bernie Kosar-led teams, the Eric Metcalfs, the Kevin Max, like, all those teams back in the day that I can recall. And when they came back, they're an expansion team. It's like they've had a hard time getting out of that and, and, and being able to consistently compete because in part ownership, which ownership already is different from back when I played. It was Al Lerner. He passed his son, Randy. Now it's a Jimmy Haslam. And then you look at the countless head coaches, the countless general managers. And, and people don't really understand the impact that it has on you, but like just in my you know short time spirit, period of being there, we were 10-6 and six my rookie year. Our next year, like I get hurt, Derek Anderson gets hurt, even Ken Dorsey gets hurt. We've got fourth-string quarterbacks, like starting games playing at the end of that season. Amongst other injuries we had, we had a whole staff breakout, all this stuff. I mean, it was wild, like stuff that you, you just can't make this stuff up. And then they just clean house. You're like, hold on a second. Like, we had a good thing going last year. Like, we were almost making the playoffs. We won 10 games. We're a good football team. We're just banged up. We had some, like, crazy circumstances that you just don't see. Well, once you get a new head coach, a new general manager, that whole roster turns over. Mm-hmm. Like, you're talking about different draft philosophy, different free agent philosophy, different techniques, different type of offense, defense that they're looking for. And so I knew right away, like, I wasn't Eric Mangini's guy. He didn't want me to be on the roster, but I was drafted in the first round on a five-year deal. And at that point, like, there was rumors that they were looking to trade me even before that season. And so, like, I just remember going into it thinking, like, I got to do everything I can to, like, prove to everyone, like, that that I can be the guy or whatever it was. And so he, he benched me after, like, two and a half games into it. And I was like, okay, like, didn't feel like, you know, I played well, but obviously not that bad. And then, you know, Derek Anderson went in for a number of games, and then I finally get an opportunity to go back in and start playing better. But, um, you know, hurt my I had a Liz Frank injury, which plagued me for a long time. Um, that was one of those, like, experiences in the NFL where, they, you know, oh, you don't need surgery. You can just cast it. It'll heal on its own, all that. And I, got, I get traded. I'm like, okay, now I, now I see what's going on there. I get traded to Denver and – you know, I, I just got surgery a few years ago because I never had the chance to take off six months to let it heal and rehab it and then, you know, start over again. Um, but that was the tough part is, like, when they changed over to Eric Mangini and George Kikinis, I mean, they fired George Kikinis after eight weeks. Like, the dude was only there half the season. He was gone. It's like, that's our general manager? All right. Like, that dude barely got a chance. Like, I don't think he even moved out of a hotel yet. Um, but, that, I mean, that was, like, that was the NFL. And then I get traded to – Denver and then Josh McDaniels gets fired the coach who trades for me <laughs> into that season so now we got a new head coach the next season I'm in the final year of my deal like I remember meeting John Elway because he just came on to their front office and I was like I need you to cut me <laughs> like I need I need to become a free agent like I need a chance to go somewhere and all that um and that was obviously like the, the Tebow Kyle Orton thing and all that but um it's just tough it, it's it's tough to find any stability when there's so much changing out around you and that and so yeah like do I go back and think about how things would have been different if I got got drafted by another team sure like the entire 22nd pick when I got drafted by the Browns 
I was talking to the Baltimore Ravens. The Ravens were trading to 23, I believe, with the Kansas City Chiefs to take me. And so I was talking to Brian Billick. I was talking to Rick Newhouse. I was talking to Ozzie Newsome. And I kept thinking in my head, like, wow, like, I was just in Baltimore for the Johnny Unitas Arm Award, like, loved it, loved the Unitas family, like, would be so excited to go back there and play for them, like Ray Lewis, Ed Reed, all these, like, studs that you're playing with. Um, and then the Browns called and, like, drafted me. And so it was, like, a crazy whirlwind of emotions, mm. you know? Like, I was getting drafted. I'm, like, literally sitting on a couch, and I pick up my phone, and I'm, like, 2-1-6, and six, what's this? And so literally, I'm, like, holy crap. And there was a minute left in the pick, and I was like, I didn't think that could happen that fast. Yeah. And so, like, literally, like, someone could rush down there, like, grab me to get on the stage. Um, and, yeah, that was – it was just a crazy change of events. But I remember, like, when I had a chance to catch my breath and then obviously looking back on it, I think you always look back and go, how different would things have been, you know, in a much more stable situation like that. Mentally, how did you get through um, just your time with the Browns and then even going to – the Denver to where it's like you didn't even get an opportunity really there to where yeah. you come from, you come off this, this, this Heisman campaign in college and going first round and you get into, you get into your NFL career and it just goes, it doesn't go the way you plan for it. No. So I mean, how, how did you cope with that? And like, how did you get through that? That's a, that's a great word for it. Cope. Like, because that's what I felt like I've, I've learned the older I've gotten um, is, is really, that's probably what it was. I think the hardest thing for me was like when, when you're doing everything you possibly can, training, film, like everything, and you're not getting the results you want, it's like, well, how do I pivot? What do I change to do differently, right? Because that gave me success at one level, but it's not leading to success now. Mm -hmm. Like, is it me? Is it something else? Like, what do I need to change? Like, that was always the hardest thing for me to determine. You know, part of it was just being unlucky. You know, I'm in my second start, Monday Night Football in Buffalo. Marcus Stroud twists through on a game. I go to throw a pass, and literally as he's coming into me, helmet hits my finger, right? Shatter this bone here, rip off all these ligaments. Finish the rest of the game, we get a win. I didn't realize it until the middle of the next week. My These two fingers were just so swollen, I could barely, like, grip the football, and so I'm trying to throw passes in practice, and, you know, Rob Chizinski, our offensive quarter, is like, what's wrong? And I was like, dude, look at my hand. I can't, like, grip the football. So we go get x-rays, and they're like, you've got malafinger. Like, you're probably going to need surgery. He's like, well, what do you want to do? I was like, I'm going to try to play. So – Try to play the first half next game versus Houston. And Rip Shearer, quarterback coach, is like, hey, it just doesn't look right. He's like, it doesn't look like the ball is coming out of your hand well. I was like, well, I was like, I mean, you guys watched all week. Like, this is the best I can give you. Like, I, yeah. I need time to figure out how to throw because I basically had to use my ring finger on my right hand because I couldn't really use my index or my uh, – I couldn't use this either. It just kind of hung like that. That's what – everything's kind of torn off, so it just hangs. But anyway, um, I ended up getting surgery after that, so I was out the rest of that season. That next season, you know, I talked about getting benched by Coach Mangini, and then when he put me back in, I started playing better football. But as I'm on a, on a keeper, we're in Kansas City. I'm, I'm running to put us in field goal range to have the go-ahead score. Dude lands on my foot as I'm, like, running out of bounds. And I remember, like, getting up thinking, like, I broke something. I don't know what it was, but I broke something. Fortunately, I turn around, hand it off to Jerome Harrison as we're, like, positioning for, like, a field goal, and he busts one for a touchdown. The rest, is, the rest is history for that game. You get the win, but at that point, like, I was done, mm -hmm. right? That was it. So I didn't get to start as much as I would hoped. I didn't get to play as much as I would hoped. I kept having these, like, crazy, like, unlucky injuries. You know, the Denver situation, never got an opportunity there. Um, I get to Kansas City. I get a concussion in preseason. I get a concussion during the season. Um, just, like, there was always something that kind of kept me from getting any sort of stability. Um, you know, I signed with Seattle. I told you about that year and year seven. I ended up um, signing with the Jets after I got released in Seattle. And and, and like I said, like John Isaac was up front about it. He said, we're not going to keep you for the full year. So when they released me, I got picked right up by the Rams. First week I'm there, I'm warming up back squatting in the weight room, herniated two discs in my back. And I'm just like, my God, man, like what what did I do wrong to like have just any little thing? Like I thought at one point I'm just going to slip on a patch of ice and like break my arm at this point. But I don't know. That played, I think, a part in all of it is just not ever really being able to be, like, healthy enough to be at my best. Um, but, like, coping with it, I mean, I think I think part of it's just having to realize, like, how fortunate I was in the first place, right. you know, um, just to have the opportunity. I mean, not many not many kids get ever to, like, live out their childhood dream of playing, like, for Notre Dame and then going to play for the Cleveland Browns, who I grew up rooting for. That was pretty special. And then, you know, I just tried to – think back on all the relationships that I was able to make. I mean, even in broadcasting, like that's gone a long way for me where 
when you play for, I mean, in year eight, I'm in training camp with the Dolphins, right? And I, I remember at that point, I was like looking at dudes in the locker room. I was like, man, this is different. Like dudes are just buried in their cell phones. Like they're all on social media. I'm like, I remember the days like we used to like just kind of sit and talk or whatever, right. listen to music and guys would be like freestyling. And it was like, none of that. I was yeah. like, dudes were quiet. Just sit. I was like, these cats are different. <laughs> like, yeah. I was like, I'm, I'm like 30 now. I, I don't know how I feel about all this, but um, I just remember, I mean, my experience of meeting so many different people, it kept me connected enough to the game where now in broadcasting, like there's still so many different people who are, are you know, coaching and head coaches mm -hmm. or general managers or, you know, wherever they're at, they're at at this point. Now, we talked about a little bit off camera and a, a lot about your career as well. How important do you think this ability is in terms of a quarterback? Because it's only 32 jobs. I mean, right. as a DB, you know, it's a bunch of guys and you got nickels now and quarters and stuff Man, like no, that. Yeah, nickels are your base defense now, Sean. <laughs> you guys, are, you got it easy. For real. So it's just like, I think of Josh Allen and how everything went right for him his first three years. Mahomes literally sat behind Alex Smith and had it like Andy Reid. Yeah. Lamar came into a stable situation with the Ravens. Just talk about how important stability is at that position in the league. It's it's huge. You know, like I got flagged earlier this year for making a comment about Zach Wilson and the New York Jets and their outlook for this year. Now, a lot of that has to do with who they're playing the first nine games. I mean, they, they have a ridiculous schedule. But the other thing was, like, look, I, like, I've been in that organization. Like, look at the track record of, of the history of that team and how they handle things. And even more than that, like, the, and, and they're a much more talented team than what they were before he got there. But the hard thing is, is, like, it's not, I mean, there, look, there's only so many Lamar Jacksons, Josh Allens, Patrick Mahomes, you know, Aaron Rodgers, like, Tom Brady, like, extreme talent. The truth of the matter is, like, if you can find yourself in one of those situations, it gives you a much better chance of being able to make it, even if you don't have that that sort of talent and ability. And that's the hard part is is when you go into a league where there's only so many guys who can like raise the level of everyone else out around them, and the rest just need to be in the right situation and circumstance. It, it makes it harder to like be able to to cash in and have that successful career that you're looking for. So, um, you know, for me, it, it never really got that opportunity. Never really got. Um, that chance for that to happen, whether I was via injury or getting traded, just, you know, whatever circumstance came along with it. But I, th I think that's the hardest thing is, is you can have all the ability in the world. If you're in a tough situation or circumstance, it's not going to matter. Right. I mean, you're just gonna have a hard time overcoming that. And that, that goes for like beyond football. That goes for anything, right? Like you're in a, you could be a rock star, like writing code. If you're off the wrong startup, man, like it ain't going to work. Like, I'm sorry. Yeah. If you got totally, mismanagement, totally like if your matter. CFO, or your CEO, and they don't know, have a vision and this guy doesn't know how to do accounting properly, like you're probably not going to do very well. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're burning through cash. Yeah. So moving, I mean, I think we should, we should definitely move forward to Brady Quinn now. Yeah. And I mean, you're, you're living in Fort Lauderdale. Um, Married to Alicia, to the yeah. U.S. the USA uh, Olympic gymnast, and so yeah. uh, just talk about just your family life and just like what you like what you're up to now. It's awesome, man. I'm a girl dad times three, so I've got three little girls: Sloan, Tegan, and Cassidy. Uh, Sloan's almost six. Tegan just turned four, and Cassidy's two and a half. Uh, they're the love of my life, man. Like fatherhood is like you talked about coping, like with your career and all that. It's like I don't really think about like what went wrong or what didn't go right, I really think about more of the lessons and all the things that I can apply from what I learned playing to fatherhood or how I, I like kind of scheme and plan my attack as their father because they're all very different personalities. Like, you know, Sloan's my sweetheart. She's my, my firstborn. She wants to get everything right. She's more sensitive. She's a little more emotional. But she's like, she's like the cuddler, you know? Like, she's just such a sweet, sweet kid. Tegan is like, gonna be a beast like she's just she's gonna be a good athlete things come to her very naturally easy but she also tends to be a little more you know temperamental mm -hmm. and then our little swan cassie is like the cutest little button but she's always stubborn so like that one right now she's kind of too young to really be able to like communicate with but she is like as stubborn as i'll get out but you could put her on autopilot and that little girl like entertains herself She'll put herself to bed. She like will tell you what she wants to eat. Like she's really easy going until she doesn't get what she wants. So it's like coming up with a game plan every day yeah. for how I'm going to handle each one of those three personalities on top of my wife, who is her own personality or a combination or a pieces of all three of those. Mm. So it's awesome though, man. Like, I mean, we're not done. Like I'll, we'll probably keep trying to have kids. Um, we want to have a big family, but it's, um, it's just, it's cool how like football has played such an impact on my, my perspective and outlook. Like, I feel so indebted to the game 
for the relationships that I've made, but also like the things that it's, it's taught me just even in fatherhood or even in marriage. Mm-hmm. Well, I think this was uh, an excellent episode. I mean, I appreciate you uh, coming on. I mean, we, we made it work. We were down in beautiful Fort Lauderdale. We How long are you guys staying in town for? Uh, well, I really don't have to. My friends are having a, a camp um, on Saturday okay. at, back at St. Ed's. Um, so I, I'm going to go back there for that. And then okay. he has to get back. Rochester. Rochester. Oh, okay, so, I've been to Rochester. Uh, we're trying to get him like. I don't know if I can say this, but we're trying to get him out of out of Rochester. We're trying to Whoa. get him. Uh, we're trying to get him full time with with the Varsity House crew. So, there you go. There you um, go. Who, 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 who do they have to talk to about that? Who, 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 you gotta talk to my my employers up in Rochester, my, my local TV station up there. But we gonna we gonna cross that bridge when we get there. Yeah, Man, so, you know, <laughs> so I went to Rochester. So my my one of my good friends going out play baseball with his dad was the AAA baseball commissioner, Randy Mobley. And so we went up on like a tour through some of the AAA uh, stadiums. We went to Rochester. It was the last game they ever had at that stadium before they changed and built whatever else they built after that. But I remember we had to be like bat boys for like one of the trips. I think we were in Syracuse. Uh Was like the Syracuse Chiefs? Uh, They were the Chiefs. They were the Chiefs. Okay. Okay. So we, I remember we had a bat boy back then. I'll never forget, man. Like, it's not, obviously, if you don't do it a lot, like, you kind of forget sometimes, like, oh, you have to go get the bat because mm-hmm. you're, like, watching what happens in the play. <laughs> so I'll never forget it was, like, a night game, and I, I remember sprinting over to go grab the bat because I was a little late because I was watching what happened with the play, and I, like, it, it was obviously due, and so I, like, I slipped, and, like, I I've, I hit so hard, and I, like, kind of sat there for a second. I was like, God, I hope no one saw that. <laughs> and I, I, like, rolled to grab the bat, popped up quick, and, like, everyone's just kind of pointing and laughing. I was like, well... Not much I can do about that, man. But I remember going to Rochester after that, and uh, yeah, I mean it was it was an interesting experience, you know. Inter- Rochester, interesting place. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> going to school in, in Syracuse, I'm kind of like used to the whole upstate vibe. But upstate's like so different than like growing up in Ohio. So like I'm yeah. used to it by now, but definitely I can see myself relocating. I mean, I saw some dude get like thrown on top of a cop car, and getting cuffed. I was like, that was the first time I saw something violent like that in Rochester. So I was like, well, New York is about, yeah, New York. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> like, New York is different. Yeah. Sure. It was not like that in <laughs> Columbus. It was not like that. Oh uh, yeah, no. But um, will you be at the, if you can answer this, will you be at Ohio State Notre Dame? Uh, we do not have that game. That's an ABC primetime game. Um, we will be in West Lafayette for uh, Penn State Purdue. Like the weird thing about that game is that was actually part of the Joe Buck trade to ESPN. Wow. So Fox got that game in exchange for Joe Buck, who was under contract with Fox. But now Joe Buck and Aikman are going to do Monday Night Football together. So that was a part of that trade. They're trading games out here? They're trading games, man. (laughs) Like, I don't don't know how all that works behind the scenes. I assume they know, like, primetime Thursday night, Penn State, Purdue will rate, like, X. And they can make X amount of dollars off that. So I assume that's like the trade and all of it is like how much money it's worth. I was listening to Clack because that's like definitely like who I look up to in terms of this space. You guys draft these like games? Yeah, so like, there's a draft process. And for each conference, right, there's like someone has the rights to it. So Fox has the first pick every year of the Big Ten, right, the entire season schedule. So obviously Ohio State, Michigan, which is the highest rated game, always is their number one pick. So what do you think ESPN and ABC took? Ohio State, Notre Dame. Now, they have, like, redrafts after that, right? So there's, like, a top 10 or whatever they pick, and then after that it's, like, a 12-day pick, 6-day pick, meaning, like, there's some weeks we don't know where we'll be. It depends on who has the first pick and how the season turns out. Mm -hmm. And so we'll find out, like, 6 days ahead, 12 days ahead. Um, But that's one that, like, as they redraft, as we get closer to the season or whatever, like, that's not going to change. Like, they're they're keeping that pick. So there's no way we could be there. I I wish, but – yeah. Uh, yeah, there's no I way we like can be this there. conversation might ne- might never end, but I got some questions. That's why um when you say you get like the you get like the you may get the game like 6 days ahead. How yeah. is that process um cuz I mean, I'm sure cuz he could talk about this doing 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 games where uh he did a Syracuse game and he's like, "Yo, like I went to Syracuse, I know these guys." And he did a play-by-play and it was just it was a lot more difficult than what he expected. You could probably speak on No, it like more. for real, like when you're watching games on TV, you think yeah. Oh, these guys showed up an hour before the game and just got just talk ball. Because how hard is it to talk ball? You've done it yeah. your whole life. But then you got to know the backup quarterback. You got to know the backups oh, backup. Yeah. You got to know like all this stuff. You got to be able to fill time. And obviously, you think, oh, the play by play guy, he does all the, the hard work. But you as an analyst, you're going to have to fill oh, storylines. And it's just play by play guy is easy because he's just watching what happens and telling what happens. Like now he can add some storylines depending on 
the type of style he is as a play-by-play, like your purest play-by-play, they just call what they see and they get out of the way. And then you as the analyst should be providing the analysis, the storylines, all that stuff. But, I mean, I, I always say this. As an analyst, you're going to watch more film than you did as a player. And that's not like, oh, I didn't watch a lot of film. It's like, no, 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 no. You have to watch all three phases, both teams. And so that's where, like, people don't understand. Like, you're not just watching, like, one defense, every situation, countless games to prepare as a quarterback. You're watching all three phases and reading other storylines, all this other stuff. So it's a ton of prep. Um, you know, when you're calling a game, it's like digging a mile down inch wide. When you do a pregame show like we do, it's a mile wide inch deep. So you just got to know a little bit about everything and then yeah. make sure you also know about, you know, the game that you're at. Like you want to have in-depth detail on those players, that coaches, those storylines, all that sort of thing. When you, when you do a halftime show or when you're on that halftime. Yeah. How do the highlights like? Do you pick your highlight that you no, want to talk about? It is wild. Like, like that's, that's, that's the on, one thing dude. that I really want to know is because like I see highlights pop up and it's like you just go into them and like like you picked it like you were just ready for that highlight. How I mean, so, it sometimes it works out like that. Other times it doesn't. I mean, when you're on site, you could have all sorts of issues with like even getting a shot sheet is what they call it. So you'll have like you'll know kind of what plays they're gonna pick. Because I mean, honestly, like we'll be down on the sidelines like watching the first quarter of the game, maybe the first half if it's like a lit environment. And so, you know, like if we ever leave after the start of a game or we're on site for a game, it's only because we have to watch what else is going on so we know what replays we may see later on. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of times you like want to stay down there like a fan and watch it and like see because you also see things you're not going to get on TV. So that's the hard thing is like then because then if you stay out there too long, you don't know what the hell is happening in the rest of the college football world. And you're out there in halftime. You're like, who is this? Like, yeah. what happened? Like, <laughs> what am I seeing? Like, obviously, you got to react in like real time as right. far as what to say. So there's definitely like a niche and a way of like doing that. It's not easy. Yeah. I thought this was a, a great conversation. I think it's going to do uh, really well. Um, you wanted to ask about Tebow. What happened with that? Well, I guess we could. T well, I mean, oh, I yeah. you guys were teammates. We, we, we wanted to we talk were. about we, we wanted teammates. to talk about Tebow, but we kind of just kept talking about we got we had to touch on like you know the Notre Dame faithful gonna want to hear about that time the Browns. Yeah. We, we I'm trying to like we've done some episodes with the Browns. We got a, a Cavs one coming up as well. So it's like got to get those Cleveland faithful what they want to hear. And so now we could just go into like some some I guess we didn't talk about the current Browns though. I mean, Whoa. my God, what a situation that is. Okay, before we get to the current Browns, you played with Tebow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and were you on the roster during Tebow Mania? Yeah, so um, I got traded there was his second year. that March. No, 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 he got drafted there the year I got traded there. Oh, okay. So the, the interesting thing was, you know, they never intended on using him as a quarterback when Josh McDaniels was there. He was going to be like a wildcat, kind of um, short yardage, goal line type type player. Like a slash player. That's a first for a first round pick too. Both, that, but he was he was the second of the first round picks. Remember they took Demarius Thomas, yeah. Yeah, was the first true. one. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the plan for it. And then what happened is obviously once Josh McDaniels got fired and that fan base was like clamoring for him, he goes in. And you know we had to we had to simplify some things and change some things, and especially because like you went from a very sophisticated starter in Kyle Orton who even from his days at Purdue to in the NFL, he could spin it. I mean, that dude from the pocket was lethal. He was accurate. He was smart. He understood what defense was trying to do. He knew how to counteract that. Um, big time, like, student of the game, very talented passer. Tim was very raw, like, from throwing motion standpoint, accuracy, you know, his understanding of, of the game was more of, like, the things he had done with Coach Meyer to be successful at Florida, which is does not really work in the NFL. I mean, unless you're just kind of ad-libbing, which, like, <laughs> some of those plays were right. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. Like you see that in the NFL, but um, it wasn't until the next year when, you know, Kyle got the first opportunity in there for three or four games. And then Tim came in after that. And then we really had to revamp the offense. I mean, credit to uh, Mike McCoy, Adam Gase who were there because it was, it looked entirely different. I mean, we as quarterbacks were in the room watching Oregon, watching West Virginia, watching like <laughs> old, old That's Florida tough. tape. We're like, what can we do at the NFL level to make this work? And uh, like, I'll never forget. Like, I already knew about Geno Smith before I ever got to New York because I watched a lot of his tape with Tavon Austin, mm -hmm. and they had that little push pass at a shotgun. And Tim's completion percentage was so low, we were like, "Hey, man, I went up to Gase. We got to put this in. We can do this with Eddie Royal because Eddie's quick, right. and we can get you know Tim some easy completions." I was like, "We, I was like, we can do this." 
We never put it in. I don't think we did. But like we would always come up with different ideas. Like I always had five ideas for him, different situations, different things. I and mean, we even had a playoff game that year. The, the game that we bit it was I think it was still to this day the biggest upset of a in a wild card round was over Pittsburgh. We had a package where it was both Tim and I at the, at the game at the same time because we were so bad on third down. So it was a third down package. I think it was called like Shamrock or Irish or something. And like Tim would play wide receiver. He'd play running back and I'd be in shotgun. And, you know, we, we had success on first and second down enough in that game to kind of control it. So we never got the opportunity to bring it out. But I remember running in practice and I like looked over at Coach, Coach Gase. And I was like, dude. If you just put me in on third down, like they're gonna know what we're doing. Right. I was like, we have to implement this a little bit in the first and second down, and so we tried to like kind of practice and sprinkle it in some, but um, never came to fruition in that game. And then the next week, like they're like, well, we're not gonna put it in now because you know we already won a game, mm -hmm. so um, we got our butts kicked by New England. But it you was mean, it was interesting. It was an interesting year for sure, just to see how like the games like worked in our favor. You mentioned how uh, Tim Tebow wasn't a great teammate. <laughs> I, I didn't just now say that. No, you didn't he, say that just now, but it was mentioned it was, before. It was, it was from an article with Mike Silver, who um, I, I never said he wasn't a good teammate. I said the way he went about the genuflecting, which is what you call the whole kneeling and all that, it seemed like he was taking more attention away from his team and on himself in that moment. And I'm a man of faith. I'm a man of religion. And, like, my idea of, of praying is being down around my teammates, like I did in the end zone at Notre Dame or anywhere else. And so that was all it was. I mean, and, I, and my, Mike knows this. I've said this. He took stuff out of context for that yeah. entire article. He tried to blame it on the editor of, think yeah. of so SI, whoever it was. But good, to this good, day, I've said good that. Good thing we're here to clear that story up. Really? So now we could, we could erase that quote. And we could no, he was, he, was, no he, was a, he, he was a good teammate in the sense of, like, we'd work out together. He had a great work ethic like that. Um, you know, things not working out for him or it wasn't a lack of effort. I mean, he stayed out and tried to work on his throwing motion with Josh McDaniels and Ben McDaniels and John Elway and, I think even the McDaniels dad at one point came in and, and countless people. I mean, Tom Alice worked with them, all these people. So he spent a lot of time trying to fix it. It's just it so hard at that point to change your motion and really ingrain it into actual game scenario. Right. Well, and then current Browns, we want to talk about the current Browns. What's your, your take well, on, on the whole? Well, I mean, you guys can talk about this. I well, mean, I, but I, but I feel like from a quarterback yeah, with the whole Baker situation, not necessarily <laughs> – and playing and playing through an injury, like you talk, like you talked about, just kind of unlucky. You were playing through injuries. How hard is it for a quarterback to? Because as as, a, as fans, most fans don't understand like how hard it was for him to go through that and play through those injuries. Man, it's, and being a quarterback, I feel like you could speak on that. Yeah, it, it's tough too because he just came off his best year's third year. They go to a playoff game. They beat Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh, right? They've got all this momentum. I know, I know they don't win the divisional round, but still, that's huge. It's a big step. And so now you're there and you're like trying to play for your boys. You're trying to play for that big contract and all that. And it's tough because your resume is your tape. Like that's what they'll tell you in the NFL. And, you know, it's, it's not like in college when they, you have potential. Whatever you put on tape in the NFL is your resume. And it goes, it goes on that resume and it never comes off. And that's the hard part is you don't get any brownie points for playing hurt. If you're not playing at the top level, they don't care. No one cares. And, and I think that's the tough spot is he was trying to tough it out for his teammates. He was trying to tough it out for his, his contract, the team, fans, whatever. And to me, I didn't think the Browns took care of him for doing that. I mean, they knew what he was dealing with and how much pain he was in and how it was probably impacting his ability to play. Um, I just I, – I was – I'm honestly shocked everything that's transpired has transpired. Like, never thought after what he did in year three he wouldn't be on, on a long-term extension. He'd be a, with a different team that they would sign the guy who didn't even play football last year for whatever he's being accused of um, to the biggest contract we've ever seen in NFL history. Like, all that, it's like just a wow. And, mm -hmm. and again, we don't even know if Deshaun's going to be able to play this year or not uh, or how much he'll be able to play. But it's just one of those things where it's like no one <laughs> but the Browns, man. Like the Browns, the Browns. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy because covering the Bills, I remember when Josh Allen got the huge extension, and I vividly remember texting my boys, like, yo, yeah. the Browns need to lock up Baker now because the price the price tag's only go going up. up. Yeah. And I was like, they need to lock up Baker, right? And then week two or three, he, he uh, hurts his shoulder with uh, with J.J. Watt, and, you know, that, that happening. And then things went downhill from there. So it was just crazy how literally in eight months, the entire perception about – because Browns fans can say what they want about Baker now, but – 
going into the season, we all had faith that he could be the guy going. We were forward. talking about Super Bowl. Like, let's oh, be yeah, real. Yeah, like let's, last year, was like, like, yeah. like sleeper Bowl. for Super Bowl, right? Yeah. I mean, that's what's crazy to me is just how fast it changes. Like that's life in the NFL, where you know not only is he not making what he was at least guaranteed to in his fifth year, but he's he had to, you know he had to push a portion of it to be incentives. You know, like just you don't see, you don't see that scenario happening very much. Like I thought he was gonna be cashing in, not giving cash back that he has to earn through incentives. Do you think that there's any? Do you think the franchise has changed at all in terms of its ability? Because I understand that they are making changes, but the GM has been there for going on his third year now. Stefanski's going on his third. Year. Do you see any difference from when you were playing there, or is it still some of that lingering effects of? Maybe there's more stability now. I mean, again, I don't. We'll see what happens this year. You know, if they have a seven and um, what ten season, or you know, six and eleven season. I mean, who knows how Jimmy Haslam will react? I mean, the problem was. He fired Rob Shazinski after one year. You know, he was running through coach after one year. And it's like at some point you have to look in the mirror and go, well, who's making the decisions on who's hiring this guy? Mm-hmm. Oh, I am. Okay, maybe I need to remove myself from making the decisions on some of this. Um, and it doesn't matter if it was just head coaches with general managers, you know, the the direction that they were going, the way they did, you know, Hugh Jackson. I mean, the, the whole thing is just like, I, I honestly don't know. I mean, I, I'm not close enough to them. To really know that, I mean, I can I can only look from the outside from guys that you know played after I had left there and the way they talked about the change in ownership and all that. You know, it's kind of the same old conversation like we talk the Browns be Browning sometimes. You know, like that's just like that's kind of how it, it seems like when like something crazy happens, it always is tied back to some of the Browns. And I don't know why, but again, it goes back to like that wasn't the team that I as a child root for. Like that's the team that came back as an expansion team. Final question. Who would you say is the most handsome Brady? Between Brady Quinn God, if I can and only look, Tom Brady. If I can only look like half as good as that at his age. Dude. And he's <laughs> still playing. It's incredible. And like he's going to be 45 this year. He looks better now than when he did when he was 22, bro. That's what I'm saying. Like, he got on that avocado ice cream diet and all that. Like, I, I don't, I can't do that. Uh, I no, love ice cream. They got a Killwins down the street. If you guys haven't Killwins, you should try Killwins. It's delicious. I usually get the McDonald's McFlurry, so Oreo. McFlurries are so good. Yeah. But everyone I, can kind of make a version of that now, you know? The Oreo it's, McFlurry it's, it's, was the best. It's, it's something about that cup with the, with, with, with with the, the spoon. spoon. Yeah. Well, that spoon it's elite, yeah, bro. That's something, elite. It's something about that cup. It, that but. spoon was like sturdy. Yeah, no, <laughs> like that. That was like a legit spoon. That wasn't like this the cheap ass like plastic spoons that like, break off. That was like a legit spoon. Yeah, dude. There's something about McFlurries like that. I feel like Dairy Queen, like the way the soft serve where you dip. And you've got like the chop like that to me is like the yeah, best. The, I, I used to get the vanilla dipped in uh, yes. the dipped in cherry. Yes. Yeah, By the yeah, way, yeah. Oh, well, I knew there was one location we had where they could like mix them. They could do a portion in one, and like oh, I, I was see, like, I don't know how you yeah. do that. Well, yeah, they, we had to wait till it dried, oh. and then they do the next flavor over top for like half of it. Yeah. So it'd be like chocolate underneath, cherry on top. <sighs> but there's a guy I met. He tried to buy one. <laughs> he tried to buy like the soft serve. Dairy Queen, like, soft serve machine, and then with, like, the dipping thing. But I guess you have to, like, own a franchise to do it. He's like, oh, I don't want to spend money on owning a franchise. But <laughs> just for that. Just for that. Um, I actually got a friend who talk, who keeps telling me to go to uh, Sonic for ice cream, and I'm like, I'm not going to Sonic. Like, I'm not. Sonic's all right. It's not, it's, it's, Maybe, like, an icy. I don't know about ice yeah, cream. Yeah, that's how yeah. they got the slushies with the, with the nerds in it. That's, like, yeah. pretty good. And then they got some good tater tots. and uh, chick- Yeah, I'm, 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 I, eat, I eat unhealthy, but... Um, you're yeah. 24. You're young, man. You can, yeah. yeah, you got time. <laughs> but this was an amazing episode. I think we we got all the questions. We get, you you good? Yeah, I think so. Are you good? I, I don't think I'm good. I think we're good. You just uh, need to get his number. That's what you need. Yeah, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna work on. I think we have something. We get Varsity House to like come around some of the games, man. Yeah. We'll coordinate this. We're gonna work on that for sure. So he just he just put it in the universe, and, and we'll 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 make it happen. But um, appreciate you coming on Varsity yeah. House today. Um, where we we go everywhere. I mean, like as I, I always like to say, like we 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 t- we're top notch. Where we go for the elite, and I feel like all of our conversations are genuine and authentic. And yeah. So that's something that we pride ourselves on. And so um, this episode again, co-hosted by Carl Jones, to my right, and then the one and only uh, Brady Quinn as our guest. So and also again, shout out to uh, State and Liberty yeah, for man. the for the hospitality and sh- and showing us a good time. I mean. Probably going to get fitted for a suit if we weren't here too long. But <laughs> we're definitely going to sign up for the influencer program and figure out a way to, to work something out with them again. But 
Uh, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, Varsity House Podcast, and then follow all of our, follow all of our social media accounts at Varsity House Podcast.